Hello everyone and, and good evening. Um, we are having another round of Parenthood's virtual roundtable discussion. Um, so if you guys are joining, thank you so much. We're supposed to be starting at 8 o'clock, but we're running just a little bit late because we're trying to get the numbers up. So please, please share this live session with your friends and family members. There's a share button there that you can just click and share it to your WhatsApp group. Share it to your Facebook uh, live as well. Uh, your Facebook page and all your other social medias as well. Get them to come in and watch today's topic about schools reopening versus COVID-19, all right? So my name is Lily and I'm the editor of Parenthood Magazine and I will also be the moderator for tonight's show, all right? So thank you so much again for you guys who are watching. Um... And uh, we, today we will be taking some of your questions as well. So if you have any question or if you have comments or opinions in about today's show, about today's topic, just type them in, in the comment section below and we would be able to see them. And we will also have a chance, uh, you will also have a chance to put it uh, have your question live on the show as well, okay? So if you have any questions, please feel free to comment below. Now, school has been open for about a month, a month uh, or so at the moment. And some parents have decided to send their kids to school and some haven't. I personally have sent my son to school already. And um, that's my personal choice. And what we want to discuss today is, is it really safe for our children to be in school? Or is it just a convenience because we, you know, we want to get our lives back, right? And also, are kids able to socially distance themselves and maintain SOPs? At school, you know, teachers can't be there 24-7. So, uh, in regards to this topic, I would like to invite our guest for today. And first of all, we have Dr. Liu Zeyi. Welcome to the show. Hello, Lily. Thanks for having me today. It's my pleasure Thank to be here. Thank you for being with us. And also, next up, we have Dr. Gan Cheng Guan, who's a pediatric specialist at Hospital Putrajaya. Hi, Lily, Hello. and hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome it's a pleasure to, the to join the session today. Yes, and pleasure to have you on as well. <laughs> All right. Hi. And last but not least, we also have Ms. Lu Luan Chai, Operation Head at AZ Preschool. Is that right? That's right, Lily. Good evening, Lily. Hi, everyone. Thanks All for right. having me this evening. Nice to have all of you on the show today. Okay, now um, we're talking about schools in Malaysia. Um, so far, the government has already uh, placed strict guides and SOPs for our schools to follow. So personally, I mean, what I've been seeing in my son's school, they have been following the SOPs. Lah. <laughs> so uh, from what I can see from the outside. So I don't know what's happening uh, inside the school. But so far, what I'm seeing uh, from pictures um, that the school is sharing with the parents, they are um, following the SOPs that have been uh, uh, given uh, to the schools. But in the UK, Dr. Liu, how is it there? What's happening there? Yes, so um, it's always interesting to compare in terms of uh, what's happening um, with other countries. So suddenly, you know, because I'm in, U in the UK at the moment, so um, it's interesting to see how the schools in UK is doing with their children in terms of uh, schooling. So at the moment, um, we are in the summer period whereby the children are having a summer break. But of course, we did have a period of time whereby the children were back to school. I think UK was probably ahead of Malaysia in terms of having the school reopen uh, on the 1st of June. And so we had six to seven weeks period of uh, children going back to school after an extensive lockdown. And how the schools did were essentially, I mean, I can only speak of uh, my children, you know, 
the kind of experience I have with my children is that right. uh, um, they send us, you know, emails regularly to update us in terms of the planning organization of the school. They also have their head teacher or teachers calling us as parents regularly to to have a chat with us, making sure our children were coping during the during the lockdown period. Mm-hmm. And suddenly, you know, from my children's point of view and from the way that they reported to us were that uh, I think most children were really, really looking forward to go back to school where they miss their friends, miss the yeah. social interactions. So, I mean, in a way, it's good for children to be back because social um, development and communications interaction among them is very important. And luckily, Mm -hmm. despite the school has started in June, um, so far we have not seen any spike of cases uh, in terms of uh, um, school reopened. Right. So they went to school in June and then now they're on summer break. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Oh, I see. So when do they start school again? So they're going to go back to the new term in September. So far, the UK government... um, the plan of restarting the school in September is still going ahead, unless, of course, um, if there is a major outbreak or if the number of cases suddenly rises again, then, mm-hmm. of course, they have to review the situation. Hopefully, mm-hmm. with the number of cases being lower at the moment, so so um, with the contact tracing and also local lockdown if needed, that will not prevent every child has to be kept at home again. Right, I see. So, so so far, uh, are there like SOPs being being placed for when school reopens in last June? Yes. So, as per every nation, every government has prepared extensive guideline and SOP for every school to follow, and uh, um, most of the guidelines obviously are based on the recommendation from WHO. I see. Okay. So, um, wearing masks, I mean, in, here in Malaysia, uh, kids are wearing masks throughout their whole school period, you know. So, uh, is it necessary for them because they're already social distancing themselves? Uh, Dr. Gan, what, what, what do you think about this? Um, personally, I think that wearing masks um, is, is sort of like an extra protection. So when we want to uh, look at the necessity of um, wearing a mask in the class, first we must understand what's the function of a mask. So if I look at the function of a mask, it's, a, it's actually a protection, a filter in between our mouth and our nose and you know, to the surroundings. And when we wear a mask, we actually protected ourselves from those people that are around us when they sneeze or when they cough or even when they are talking. And there is uh, these tiny droplets that come up, comes up together from the nose, from, from the person's nose or from the person's mouth when they talk or when they sneeze or when they are having a cough. So what, if we wear a mask, those tiny droplets, it can be filtered by the mask that we are wearing when we speak to a person or we, when we are in the, in the same room or in a close contact with the person. So this is the function of the mask. And the second mm-hmm. thing is the mask also prevent those who are actually carrying the infection from spreading to others. I mean, it will not be 100% reducing the, rate, the risk, mm-hmm. but actually lower the risk. So what right. does, does the, how does the mask function in that way? It's actually when someone talk or when someone cough or sneeze, the droplets coming out from their mouth or nose is actually mm-hmm. stick or filtered by the mask that the person is wearing. So I this see. is exactly the function of the mask, right? So as we understand the function of the mask, so we're coming back to the questions on whether the child, should they wear a mask in the school or not? For mm-hmm. me personally, if the child is totally well, no symptoms, no mm-hmm. fever, no cough, not sneezing, and they are maintaining a good social distancing in the yeah. classroom that is not too crowded, that there's no closed air circulation, you know, some mm. aircon, there are closed circulations. The risk of, you know, those transmission are very low. Um, probably I would say that um, the mask, it would be an optional. Mm. 
I if see. let's say the child is in the closed room, a very close glass room, and there's a higher risk of you know um, transmission of this uh, infection, mm -hmm. then probably a mask is a better way of protection. So right. that that would be my answer for whether it is necessary or wearing a mask or not. But my general advice for parents is if your child or can tolerate the mask without de develop any symptoms, for example, feeling uncomfortable with the mask, mm. feeling shortness of breath when mm. wearing the mask, then it is actually good to wear the mask when they are in the classroom. Right. Will there, will there be any effect, say, for uh, because they're using it straight for five, six hours, you know? Will they have, like, um, uh, will it cause hip Hypoxia? Is it, is it, is it, did I pronounce yeah. it correctly? Well, hypoxia is a medical term which it just means that uh, there's lack of oxygen in our body. Right. So a lot of parents will worry whether, you know, long-term effect, the low, low oxygen yeah. in the body will lead to brain issues or learning, will mm. affect their learning uh, capacity and all those things. Yeah. Uh, there's no evidence shows that if you wear a proper mask mm -hmm. without suffering any symptoms from wearing the mask, will lead to a low level of oxygen and I mean in in and it will end up in uh had a long term sequelae to your own health. Mm -hmm. And in fact when I mean me as a doctor we nowadays we I almost wear the mask uh, probably from eight to five, you know, yeah, <laughs> uh, whenever yeah. I'm contacting. Even even when I'm sitting in the office we are uh we have to wear the mask. I mean, mm -hmm. I, even when I'm not seeing the patient, I see in the office, it's an open office with a colleague, I have to wear a mask because this mm. is the standard of practice in the hospital. Yeah. And um, what is more important is we have to make sure that the mask is a proper mask. Yes. Right? Yeah. Can and you explain second, a little bit more about what a proper mask should be? Because right. now they've got so many designs, yes. so many yes. kinds of you know, material <laughs> being used. <laughs> Yes. So, so first of all, you must make sure that the source of the mask is come from a proper source. So by looking at the brand, you know, looking at the brand, looking at the explanation of the mask, looking at the box and all those things, you know, this is not something com something that coming from, you know, I don't know, out of where. Or there's a standard of quality control for the product. That's one thing. Second thing is to look at the size of the mask. Is it for adult or is it for children? The third thing is, you know, you have to let your kid try try the mask, you don't wear a box of masks and then end up you're finding that the mask is actually, your, I mean, your child is not comfortable wearing the mask. So when the child is uh, put on the mask, you must make sure it's similar to adult, it is tightly sealed around your mouth and nose area. And then the second thing is, is you let your child wear the mask for a while, explain to your child and teach them how to recognize symptoms of when they feel uncomfortable. If they feel uncomfortable, and that's the time that they need to remove the mask or probably the mask is not suitable for the child. So those are the ways that you can do. And in fact, nowadays, you know, in the, in the market, we have a fibric mask and also surgical or medical mask. Yeah. And if you look at the WHO recommendation, they actually recommend a fibric mask for the public would be uh, sufficient. Oh. Um, and and, and um, it's, it's, about, it's not about you know, which mask to choose and, and whether fibric or surgical or medical is better. It's about how we use it and how mm, we wear it. So it has it to be and, properly. La. Yes. And, and also, when we wear a mask, how do we how we handle the mask? If we're wearing the mask and it's soaked, we are still wearing it. Mm. And, and, and we are recycling the mask or are we are touching the mask with our hands. Yeah. We didn't remove it properly. We didn't mm. wash our hands after wearing the mask. Those are actually uh, more important yeah. I see. Okay. So, Miss Lu, um, you are a school operator. So, um, what are the current SOPs that are being practiced in your school? Um, I do understand that um, there are several ways of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. As for our preschool, we are actually adopting MOE guidelines um, based on the um, Garis Panduan Tombuka Ansamula Praskola. Yeah. as well as the Garis Panduan Pengurusan Pembukaan Semula Sekolah. So, but having said that, the practice differs slightly from places to places. So as far as I know, um, um, there is slight difference between 
West Malaysia and East Malaysia. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And then even within the state, there are differences that um, can be seen. All right. Yeah. But for AZ preschool, um, we have, um, we are actually um, following these um, um, guidelines and then it's, it's divided into two types, like two sections, the universe, mm -hmm. universal measurements and mm -hmm. what we call it do we all the times measurements. Mm -hmm. So it's basically about uh, good personal hygiene, you know, clean environment, maintain the social and um, or physical distancing and as well as temperature screening, right? Yeah. Um, for for good personal hygiene. Hello. Oh, I think Miss Lu. Miss Lu, are you still there? I think, I think we're losing her a little bit. Um, it's all right. I think we'll go to the we'll go to the next question first. Yeah, sure, um, that's fine. Yeah, mm. all right. So, um, Doctor Gun, um, wearing a mask versus face shield. You know, as as a parent myself, I too have a little bit of a confusion. Like, is it the same? Does it does it work in the same way as well? Can I use a face shield instead? What's your opinion on that? All right. So coming back to that question, um, again, I'll use the similar method to explain, um, you know, the function of a face uh, shield compared to a face mask. Yeah. So the invention of this face shield is uh, initially was uh, meant for healthcare workers, right? So what it does is actually providing a shield in between our face and the person mm -hmm. that we are actually interacting with. And yeah. if you look at the face shield, there are still plenty of spaces around our face which is actually open, you know, unlike mask, it's actually totally covered and tight. So, so the function of face shield is mainly to prevent the droplets from entering the other area of our face that which, which can be a, a, a way of, you know, the infection um, contacting with us. Uh, so the aim of the face shield is mainly to protect our eyes. Mainly is to protect mm. for the eyes for the healthcare workers, and there are actually there are some standard measurement that is recommended by you know CDC of uh, uh, in the US. Uh, they say if you want to wear a face shield, there is some measurement. I mean, you have to cut the shield has to be covered below the chin, and then you have to make sure the side is properly shield up. It cannot be mm. too short or cannot be too long. It will defeat the purpose. Yeah, <laughs> if you com yeah, and then the second thing is if you compare a face shield with a mask, their function are totally different. The face shield, there are still places for when, it, when a person cough or sneeze. There are still uh, empty space. There are still gaps mm -hmm. that allow the droplets to spread across. And if you are in a closed room by wearing a face shield, somebody cough, it that it actually is it doesn't protect you, uh, comparing right. uh. As, as, as efficient as uh, wearing a, a face mask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So personally, I think that um, for children, uh, face mask, I mean, if with a face mask, is is sufficient, you know? It, 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 mm -hmm. Because if it, it, the children is wearing a face mask, when he sneezes or cough, there's already a filter protection. So right. it's less likely for the droplets to enter the eyes or anything. But for very, very young children, you know, when they are, they can't really, really wear any mask at all. I, yeah. I, I just want to uh, quickly mention one thing is for face mask, it's not recommend for any children that's less than two years old. On and off, Ooh. I'm still seeing some very young kids walking around the shopping center and their parents actually put the face mask um, across their very uh, uh, oh. young child. So actually for less than two years old, we do not recommend face mask because mm -hmm. it is very dangerous as a risk of suffocation and they can't tell. Yeah. Right. So, 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 and they can't actually, you know, they don't understand that they can't actually wear it in a proper way. So it mm. actually defeats the purpose of wearing a mask if you can't actually wear it in a proper way also. Right. So in those cases, I mean, if they really, really can't wear a mask, and you are very, very worried about, you know, and you are trying some certain ways to reduce the risk of infection, mm -hmm. then a face shield may be a, a, an alternative. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the CDC uh, from America, it, it, it is something like a, you know, alternate options, but it's not 
something that should come first before the face mask. Yeah. I see. All right. So we lost you just now, Miss Lu. <laughs> I know I, I was disconnected just now. So sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No worries. Okay. Maybe you, 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 you would like to continue from where you started. Um, you could explain right. more about how social distancing is being practiced in schools. Right, um, social distancing. Um, this is something. Um, I think this that's the the hardest thing at the moment um, <laughs> for for early years uh, education. Okay, yeah. so um, social distancing comes under the the uh, specific pre prevention uh, measure um, according to the MOE guidelines. Um, in order to make things manageable. Um, our school are trying to use timetable and um, that's including you know class schedules staggered meal times toilet time and also outdoor play time so um we are also using markings like uh, you know those uh, tapes on the table or on the floor just to let the children know you know how to keep themselves uh, um, uh, social distance from each other um, children are pre-allocated um, sittings in the classroom um, as um, at least one meter apart from each other um, you know some children even have the whole table for themselves and and then also some children we need to you know put them in the opposite end of the, the of the table i think uh, never in our life have this kind of luxury luxury <laughs> that you have the whole table to yourself, to yourself. yes you know, we, we we just have to take it in a positive positive way isn't it yeah yeah, yeah? so yeah. um for for the normal assembly or mm -hmm. um, the group PE, like uh, the group exercise or group activities that involving touching are uh, temporarily stopped at the moment mm -hmm. until we um, get the further instruction from the government. Yeah. Um, so those are the things that uh, we, we are doing at the moment just to keep uh, our children, you know, um, distance from, from each other yeah uh, i i i know i see some schools actually that they you know they spray their 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 children uh when they come in when they walk in with disinfectant spray i i'm not sure if your school does that but um let's go to dr gun again what is your opinion on that like is this safe to actually spray your child with disinfectant spray okay so this question has, has been actually um you know it, it has been raised by a lot of people and um even and even if you Google it and you search it, um, I think in the WHO, they come out a statement clearly on that, okay? Mm. So when we look at this uh, spraying disinfectant, we must understand what does it do and what is the content of the, of the disinfectant. So mm. first thing, what does a disinfectant do? It, it does, it, it's actually basically killing the germs or the virus that's on a surface, yeah. okay? We have to remember the word, the surface. All right. Then the second thing is the disinfectant, they are contain chemicals ingredient, for example, like chloride. And these uh, chemical ingredients, they are potentially haz hazardous or harmful to the person who you spray on them. So what can be helpful is, for example, if the child has an asthma, underlying asthma, and if they are allergy to this disinfectant, they might get these allergy reactions or even, you know, exacerbation mm. of their asthma symptoms and it can be potentially harmful for the kids. And the second right. thing, if the child is sensitive, skin is sensitive and they might develop skin irritations or sometimes chemical burns and some form of allergy reactions from it. So mm. this is potentially um, harmful for the children. Um yeah, and the second, the third thing is when we look at the effectiveness of this spraying disinfectants on a person, mm -hmm. if you think, if you look at it, we try to kill off the germs of the virus on the person's body. But if let's say the person already being infected by the virus, and the mm -hmm. virus is actually staying in the body, by <laughs> disinfecting on the surface, it doesn't kill off the virus in the body. 
So yeah. after the disinfection, the person went into the building or the classroom and he started to cough and sneeze and the virus come out. It's still spreading mm -hmm. it around and it still can spread to others and the children around uh, the infected person. So this is not a very effective method. And for me personally, it's very simple. Wearing face masks, practice good hand hygiene, have a good hygiene uh, habits. And that is something that we have, have to adapt and become a norm in our life. So frequent mm. hand washing, you know, cover your nose and mouth when you sneeze or when you, mm. when, when you want to have a close contact with somebody and try to wear face masks all the time in a proper way. So that, that would right. be my uh, uh, opinion on this uh, disinfecting children. Uh, um, right. so, so, doctor, do you think that, you know, the current SOPs that are in school are sufficient at the moment? Uh, what do you think? Like, so, so, okay, so if parents see that their school is actually doing this disinfectant, can they actually, like, you know, tell the school, like, hey, I heard Dr. Guan the other day uh, on Face uh, Parenthood Live. They said no good. <laughs> Yeah, it's, so, it's not. I think, like, um, yeah, Dr. Liu, would you like to say? I think, I think I concur with what Dr. Gunn has said because I have personally seen some videos of uh, some schools, you know, um, in terms of uh, sanitizing the children all body with spraying all around. I think, you know, I <coughs> being a respiratory pediatrician, naturally or biologically or physiologically you know children have higher respiratory rate or breathing rate so so you know if you're spraying all this disinfectant around their body including you know close to their upper airways you know it's actually quite dangerous that uh, they can breathe in a lot more mm. than what you actually think so so that is why you know if you look at certain countries that have very strict uh, uh, regulation in terms of you know, even when you are um, the owner of the car, you are not allowed to smoke inside the car, if, whether you are driving or not. Mm. You know, especially if you have a child inside the same car with you. And this is considered illegal because, you know, secondhand smoking in a very close enclosure, plus, you know, with the breathing rate of these children, you know, they potentially might be breathing, breathing in a lot more toxin than what you and I might be breathing in. So, right. so I, I absolutely concur with what Dr. Gunn has said. And mm -hmm. I, I, I think, you know, um, it is something that um, operators need to be mindful and uh, um, needs to be a bit more sensible in, in that aspect. In terms of whether the current um, uh, SOP <laughs> recommended by MOH, ME, uh, MOE um, is sufficient, I would say that having seen and read the guidelines produced from them, which actually are very good, comprehensive and sensible. I think the current SOPs in place are more than enough and sufficient mm. to keep our children safe when they are back to school. And suddenly, as I mentioned before, you know, the information given, written by the government are actually in line with the current WHO recommendation and practice. Of course, each operator has to review the guideline and SOP accordingly because you know, every operator's environment situation might be different from each other. And my advice to them would be try to be sensible and make sure that your staff, for example, your, your teachers and your parents are trained and uh, kept up to date with the SOPs. You know, in this kind of uh, situations, open and honest communication with, with each other would be highly recommended. And uh, it is actually everyone's responsibility in terms of tackling the the pandemic period together and help each each other in terms of controlling the virus spread yeah correct i mean okay right now i mean with the whole social distancing children children it's hard i think for me even to see that children are social distancing they, they can't touch their friends you know they they can't bergurau dengan each other and all that kan so miss lu i mean does this affect the psychology of our children i mean you know, sometimes it, there are um, activities that are required to play in groups, right? So, what do you think? I think you need to unmute your mic. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. I know this. This is so hard, isn't it? Yeah. Um, 
I think um, um, most early years educators at this moment, I think that we all have this mm. dilemma. And then it's just something that is so contrary to our practice. And it is um, um, as well as uh, our children's developmental need. Like what you say, yeah. you know, we can't be growl or we can't touch um, each other. Um, but all these challenges that we are facing at the moment, right, never in our human history um, existed before. So uh, it's quite impossible for, for me to, to give you the, the answer or uh, exactly how will it impact our children in the long term. Um, I personally think the phrase mm -hmm. social distancing sounds um, socially <laughs> isolated. You know, if you know <laughs> what I mean, you know, um, I would personally prefer physical distancing mm. instead. So, so we are physically distant, yeah, you know, with each other. Yeah, yeah. We are actually still, you know, you were still high, yeah. by, you know, we, we can still um, talk to each other. You know, we are still socializing with each other. Just that we cannot touch or we cannot play games like, you know, talk, you know, like uh, touching each other, like chasing kind of game. But we are still socialized. Mm -hmm. so, um, so in that sense... Um, as much as that we can do is that if we can create an environment for, for our children, whether, you know, at school or at home, um, for example, being present when our children are initiating, you know, learning time, mm -hmm. just by with us, um, by their side, this is the quality time that we can give to our children. So it will definitely help our children to, to develop. And for those for the children that who, who goes to school, especially, um, they will definitely keeping up with these uh, group dynamic skills. The group dynamic skills that I'm talking about here is like, you know, talking to each other in a group, they're mm. making choices, they 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 show preferences. Or even they they do problem solving things things like that. So mm -hmm. as simple as one circle time song, um, minimum once a day, and um, that potentially help our children in developing their group dynamic skill. So I in see. a yeah. So in in a nutshell, um, while the children may be keeping in a distance uh, with their peers. Um, their social skills are still continue to, to, to develop um, as long as our children are staying engaged um, and then we are providing plenty of uh, times and space um, and then we keep stress manageable and then we, we, we provide age-appropriate um, interactive uh, moments to our children. I, I hope this, uh, we can reduce the impact of social distancing or physical distancing to our children. Okay, we actually have a question from our Facebook audience. I'm just going to put it up on screen now. What happens if the child doesn't want to have the mask on? Is it still advisable to send the child to school? Who would like to answer this, Dr. Dr. Liu, Dr. Gan? <laughs> Well, um, either of us, I think, probably can answer, or I think okay. Dr. Liu may add on after answering the questions. Okay. Um, from the beginning, I think the MOH, uh, MOE initially, they didn't uh, enforce that all children must wear face, face masks to school. So what are the more important points is the kids need to understand about what is you know, the practice of physical distancing or social distancing when the child went to school. The second thing is the child need, need to understand that the importance of hand washing. The third thing is the child need to understand that even that if he's, he's not wearing mask, he need to practice covering up the mouth and nose when he's having a sneeze or, 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 or a cough and then immediately wash hand after that. That's just some example that the kids need to uh, learn and practice when they were in the school. Mm. 
Yeah. The, the second thing is also parents have a responsibility to make sure that the child is well. The child is not having some infection, not having fever, not having cough and runny nose before sending their, their children to school. So, so those are the important points for me. Um, rather than just wearing a mask, if, if you are unwell, you're wearing a mask and you still send your child to school with a mask and your child is sneezing and coughing and, and the, the, the risk of infecting others is, is getting higher in the classroom if there's somebody infected in the, in, in the classroom compared yeah. to a child that's totally healthy without wearing a mask. So you can, mm. you can see the difference, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But mm. I think also I think also that, you know, when they go to school, uh, when they see all their friends wearing masks as well and the teachers are all wearing, I think they would naturally feel like, oh, you know, yeah. I don't want to be left out. <laughs> so yes. that's what I think. I think I think with my son is also uh, if they see um, me, like my my husband and I, when we're both wearing, we know we explain to him like, you know, everyone has to wear right. masks and he understands that. I think I think kids understand more than we actually think. Right, <laughs> Doctor Liu, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so as well because um, I think it all depends on you know, uh, the child himself or herself. You know, what we shouldn't be doing is to, you know, strictly enforce and putting more pressure on the child himself or herself because I don't think that is right. Uh, um, you know, and if you look at um the the UK experience. None of my children have to wear a mask when they go to school in you know a few weeks ago because um, I think the the main important things to remember is that you know you we as parents have to be responsible and work with the school or your um, child care provider you know as a team you know making sure that we understand each other and communicate openly and and um, it's important that you know things that dr gun mentioned before you make sure that you wash the hand before and after each activity before food you know making sure that the um, the school operator is experienced and and also complying with the the moe sops and also making sure that uh, um you know um, after school you know you take your child home rather than you know bring your child to to a big crowded area know, or area supermarket or shopping center you know yeah. these kind of things you know if you are willing to work with the school and you know uh, um, have responsibility i don't see any harm why you know these children cannot go to school despite not wearing a mask mm -hmm. um so uh, to the viewers who are still watching if you have any other questions uh, please just type them in in the comment section and we will read them out as we go uh, miss lu do you have you come across any children who refuse to wear the mask and and how do you guys handle it there oh yes the challenges that you're talking about yeah yes, yes. <laughs> and unavoidably okay the challenges are massive okay in school <laughs> when it comes to, to change and the new rules and regulations, um, there are children um, um, that's um, against it, but uh, we, we try to use, we don't force him or herself to put it on. We respect that because they know the, what best for themselves. So what we're trying to, to, to do is, when we see other children are putting their masks on, we press them, okay? We, we show, we, we like um, how children put their face masks on. So when this child heard the praise for, from the grown-ups to, to his or her friends, automatically he or himself, uh, herself would want to do the same as well because, you know, he, the children uh, naturally like to get attention from, um, from grown-up. So... Yeah. So we use pressing or or sometimes unavoidably we need to use reward system um, mm -hmm. but just for temporary um, times you see so there are children against um, putting the mask on but mm -hmm. having said that there are children um, can accept it you know from day one they return to school and there are also children, you know, just uh, breeze it through and relax about it. I think it all depends on the child's personality. Yes. 
So to answer your questions, yes, there are children against um, the mask. Okay. Do, yes. Are there any other challenges um, that schools are, are, are going through? Oh, yes, of course. Um, for parents' aspect, you see, um, we, we, me, me and myself um, as a parent, um, we do feel conscious or, you know, um, anxious as well when we need to send our children back to, to school with this strict SOP. But we have to bear in mind that our children actually feed off our emo emotional state. So mm. just keep the communication going with school, like um, approach your school, you see um, what's going on at the moment, you know, what should I do, um, what kind of preparation I can I can do for my children, you know, things like that. And then um, um, I'm sure ch uh, school, they would give, um, oh, as a as a school, we, we give lots of information to our parents ahead of time. So mm -hmm. let the parents to have plenty of time and space to get themselves ready when they are ready they will send their uh, children back to school. So there's no right or wrong answer. So it right. all depends on um, how um, uh, parents or uh, school um, working together to, 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 to face these challenges. Right. We have another question from Facebook. So some recent research pointed out that young children are less susceptible to COVID-19. Is this true? Doctors, Dr. Gan, <laughs> Dr. Liu. Yes. yes, so based on um, the data available at the moment, um, it is clear that children are less susceptible uh, to COVID-19 compared mm -hmm. to adults. If you look at the rate of uh, hospital admission, severity of the illness, uh, mortality rate, you know, adults are way ahead in terms of suffering from these illnesses compared to children. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you look at uh, um, the mortality rate of children, you know, for a whole group is actually, you know, less than 1% in most countries. So it may, there are a lot of postulation in terms of why this might be the case, because traditionally respiratory infectious diseases tends to be uh, much more prevalent in children. For example, you know, RSV, rhinovirus, etc. tends to be quite virulent and prevalent, especially, you know, for example, in, in, in UK would be winter time when the school reopened. We, we, we know that third week of September, we will suddenly see a surge of uh, respiratory diseases. Um, but COVID-19 seems to be, you know, in children seems to be less in terms of uh, uh, the prevalence rate so there are many postulations going around but uh, until now you know scientists and clinicians are, are still trying to figure out in terms of you know why children are less susceptible compared to adults it may well be due to the type of development of the lungs in children mm. compared to adults which give them some protection but uh, we need more information and time will tell. Dr. Gan, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I totally agree with uh, what um, Dr. Liu has been uh, uh, mentioned. Um, so and if you look at even in Malaysia, I mean, during the early in, uh, incident MCO until now, there are children mm -hmm. that are being infected with this COVID-19. And so far, uh, from what I know is we don't have any children that you know, suffer from the disease in terms of you know, death or anything. Yeah. So uh, they are doing relatively well when they get infection, but we need still need more information about this uh, virus uh, in terms mm -hmm. of how does it uh, affect the children. Um, so, I mean, just because of we're saying that the children are less susceptible, susceptible to this virus and also they are doing better than the adults, doesn't mean that they should be allowed to, you know, 
uh, yeah. <laughs> to do anything they want because they are living with the adults. They are not living yeah. in another world or in another group. So it's, it's they, also a they safety break precaution. The virus easily, yes, right? <laughs> correct. So 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 it's a safety precaution for the children and also for the parents and also for anyone that is working with the children. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think one last question before we wrap this up. Uh, what are your suggestions to parents in easing the transition of going back to school for those who have not yet gone back to school? Yeah, so I mean, I have a few suggestions to parents uh, in terms of easing the transition of going back to school. I think, you know, first of all, I think it is important that you you talk to your child in terms of how they are feeling about going back to school and try not to make any assumption. Try to talk to them, ask them whether if they are worried or feeling scared about anything or whether they are actually excited about looking forward to meet their friends again. Mm -hmm. No matter how the child feels, let them know that it's completely normal and fine to have mixture of emotions because everyone will be there in the same boat. Encourage them to ask questions. I also think that it's important that we as parents provide our child with as much information about their new norm, their new routine and the school day as much as you can. This will help them to prepare any changes that have been made to the timing of the day, the layout of their classrooms, their peer groups, play times, and for younger children, sometimes can be very helpful for them to visualize these changes. So it's perfectly normal or fine if you can ask your child's school if they can send any pictures so that this can help them to feel more familiar. Mm -hmm. You can try to reassure your child because during the lockdown, everyone has been told that everyone has to stay at home remain socially distant from others and wash our hands regularly. This means that children sometimes can find it difficult to go back to school because it will be a huge shame for them. Talk to your child about ways that they can stay safe at school, especially older children, teenagers is in particular very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there are many, many resources that has been written, you know, various type of storybooks, um, in fact, I think um, AZ Preschool has written one uh, written by Children for Children, um, mm. uh, a, a storybook about COVID-19 to, to make sure that the children, you know, whilst recognizing the impact of COVID-19, they can actually uh, understand uh, the disease itself. The other suggestion would be trying to reestablish the routine to help your child ease into school life. There's no question that because of the lockdown, the sleep-wake cycle and the, the routine of the child has completely been disrupted. You know, my mm -hmm. children are the same as well. There's, there seems to be, you know, staying up later <laughs> when, when, the, previously when they have schools. So, you know, it's important that uh, you can get them to be ready, try to gradually get them to be their usual routine so that uh, um, they can get better um, uh, in terms of get back to the routine much quicker when they when they go to school. I think mm -hmm. importantly, as Miss Lu mentioned earlier, don't put pressure on yourself. Mm -hmm. Because if we as parents, if we feel stressed, feel emotional, our children can sense it. And yeah. then this will transmit to make our children feeling anxious as well. Try your best to support, reassure, not just themselves, but yourself as well. And seek support if you need it. So work with your schools as a team, have an open communication with them, in terms of uh, finding out their timetable and what they are doing for your for your child and the rest of the children. In terms of if your child has any underlying um, health illnesses, you can also speak to your child's physicians or clinician in terms of your concern. I mean, certainly 
every country has their own shielding guideline in terms of which group of children should be, shouldn't be going back to school and which mm -hmm. group of children that needs to be taking slightly extra precaution. So if you are feeling nervous or unsure, please ask. There's, there's, there's always people available for you to ask. Right. Miss Lu, um, what, what, what is the rate of parents uh, that go back to, to school? I mean, the, the children that go back to school. Uh, are parents uh, okay are, in your particular school? Yes. Um, having said that, um, since July, um, we have about 50% um, of children coming back. Um, and then from time to time, there are more children coming back. You see, so so there there is um, improvement in terms of numbers. Right. So I think um, some parents would love to you know wait and see what's going on mm. to gain a bit more confidence on right. uh, sending children back. So you know, parents, you 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 have all the time, and you you when you are ready, you can always send your children back. Yeah. Okay, we have, uh, I think I'll just take one last question here from Facebook. There are so many types of masks in the market selling at different prices. How do I be sure that the one that I buy is the one that is effective against viruses? All right, maybe Dr. Gunn, would you like to answer that? Um, okay, so, so there are a lot of uh, masks. And in fact, for each type of mask, there are different companies that are producing it. Um, so, in terms of how to choose the mask, first of all, we must make sure the mask, the source of the mask is, is a quality one. Then it's come from a, a company with a, you know, ISO or it's a quality reassured, quality certified uh, production of the face mask. Then second is you have to make sure the mask is, is it meant for the children? Is it meant for adult? The size? And the third thing is you have to know the mask, is it, for re, is it reusable? Also, for example, certain type of uh, fibric masks, they are reusable. And then certain type of masks, for example, the surgical or the medical masks, they are not reusable. And in fact, there, there's a limit of time of using it. So for example, some surgical masks or medical masks, they can use up to six to eight hours. And after that, it's recommended to change and they are not uh, reusable. Um, Generally, for public use, we're not really saying that you must use a medical mask. As long as you have a properly fitted mask to your own, and that is more than enough. Mm. So as I mentioned before, the mask, the purpose is to trap the droplets. And right. the second thing in terms of choosing the mask, for me, what is more important is also how you wear the mask, how you handle the mask, how you remove the mask. Um, and those are the things that is very important as well. So for example, you need to wash your hands before you uh, wear the mask and all those things. For me, yeah. how you buy a mask that is a quality mask is if you're really, really, uh, 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 really, really afraid that you buy a dodgy mask or buy mask that is not a uh, good quality, what you can do is you can go to a pharmacist to look for certain brands. Maybe you can speak to the pharmacist to find out which brand and ask the pharmacy to, to talk to you about the product itself and all those things. And then try it out with your children. And sometimes when you try it out, you know, those masks, you can see that before you use it, there's stain on top of it, or it's actually there is some um, um, defect and those are not good quality and Potentially, it is not functioning as a, a proper mask. So those are the signs that the mask is not a good quality. So, for example, the mask had a hole and all those things got stains up and or even the string around the mask is very loose. Uh, those are the signs that telling us that the mask is not really a proper a good quality mask. <laughs> all right. And I think just now uh, there's another question about uh, face shield for children. I think... Uh, previously, Dr. Gunn has already mentioned that um, it's not really necessary, right, Do Dr. Gunn? I mean, it's like an no. extra protection, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Robert, I hope we answered your question as well. So, I think that's all the time that we have for today. It was a very, very interesting topic. And thank you so much to all the guests. Um, do you have any last words? Any Anyone? Do you guys have any last words maybe for the parents who are watching? 
Miss Lu, do you have any last words for the parents? Yes, of course, parents. Um, <laughs> just take your time, as I said um, earlier. Take your time, you know, observe and then uh, keep communicating with your school. Find out more from your school and until you feel comfortable and you can go ahead and try it. Yes, um, like how my friend put it, okay? If there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> Yes. That's right, that's right. Dr. Gan, your last words? Yeah, um, I know this COVID-19 uh, pandemic has caused a lot of fear uh, to everyone that's living in this world. Um, we shouldn't look at the, the negative part. We should you know, adapt and change around it. In the meantime, um, adapt and make it like a norm. And we can find a lot of fun things to do. It's just, it's, it's just the way of how we explore that. We can be creative. You know, I mean, we are very creative. Even now, you see, we are creating face shield, all those things. <laughs> so we are very creative. So in terms of creating fun with the children, with your, uh, in the schools and all those things, there are a lot of things that we can done with the children. And in fact, when I see my patients in my clinic, most of the patients that I've seen, they are actually quite happy after going back to schools. And um, I haven't seen any kids so far yet in my clinic that's refusing wearing a face mask in my clinic. Unless those yeah. that are less than two years old. Um, most of them, they didn't wear it in a proper way, which uh, we just have to tell them and teach them and remind them. So those are the roles that the adults have to uh, do. Then the second thing is for adults and parents, we have to be, at, uh, as, a, as a role model, we have to give a good example to the children. We have to wear the mask in the proper way. We have to handle the mask in the proper way. We have to wash the hands and do the proper hand hygiene techniques in front of our children. If you are not doing it, we don't expect our children to do it. I mean, it's as, as uh, simple as that. So yeah. yeah, that's my advice for all the parents. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Liu, your last words for the parents who are watching? Yeah, I think Miss Lu and Dr. Gan um, have summarized for me already. So I'm not going to say too much about it. I think the main thing is, you know, this new norm is going to be a test for all of us. And I think, as Miss Lu said, if you have a will, there is a way. And also, you know, I think our children are actually coping a lot better than what you think. So yeah. I think let's work together and let's go get over this soon together and uh, um, together we will be able to, um, you know, get over this pandemic soon. Right. All right. That's a wonderful, wonderful uh, conclusion. I think all of us uh, need to be more careful. We just need to be good room, role models for our children, especially. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time, Dr. Liu, Dr. Gan, and Miss Lu. It was really nice chatting with you tonight. And you, so enjoy the rest of your night. And to the other rest who are watching, thank you so much for tuning in. And we hope to see you on our next Parenthood virtual roundtable discussion soon. So bye-bye, everyone. And thank you so Bye. much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Lily. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.